Mr. Chairman, I refer to the recently released interim report of the Tripartite Committee on Workplace Fairness. PSP has high hopes of the committee, which was set up just before our debate on foreign talent policy in September 2021. But we have found the interim report to be inadequate in at least two areas. We hope the committee will consider and incorporate our views in the final report. First, there's an inadequate focus on the job security of Singaporeans. The report noted that the most common form of workplace discrimination is nationality, which accounts for close to 60% of the complaints received by TAFAC as it is quite unlikely that foreigners will complain about discrimination when they have no automatic right to work in Singapore, many of these complaints must be from Singaporeans complaining that foreigners have been preferred. Workplace discrimination against Singaporeans is thus prevalent. I hope the new legislation would enforce meaningful, meaningful changes in the quality, number and concentration of foreign work pass holders that the government, including the Prime Minister, have identified as potential problems in July 2021. Stronger actions can be taken to ensure that our workplaces remain diverse. MOM should consider imposing diversity quotas or limits on the total percentage of a company's workforce that may be from a certain foreign nationality. This will, have, this will be a stronger safeguard than Compass in ensuring that our workplaces do not become communal enclaves where one foreign nationality is favoured over others. To complement that policy, we should also take out recommendation number nine, which provides exemption for SMEs that employ less than 25 employees. This is a loophole, a potential loophole, that will allow larger companies to set up subsidiaries that employ one local and 24 foreign PME ETs. The PSP has also repeatedly urged the government to introduce a $1,200 monthly levy on employment past holders. This is urgently needed to level the playing field for Singaporean PMEs because employers will have to pay more and more CPF contributions for Singaporeans as the ordinary, ordinary wage ceiling is raised, making Singaporeans less competitive on wages compared to foreigners. The second area that I'm concerned about is the circular nature of our workplace and employment laws. Everyone should be free to practice their religion, but this should not hinder anyone else from earning a living. I noted recommendation number 10 in the interim report that religious organizations should be allowed to make employment decisions based on religion and religious requirement for all workers. This appears to be a reversal of MOM's stance in 2013. At that time, a pregnant church employee was sacked in the seventh month of her pregnancy because she had conceived a child in an extramarital relationship against church teachings. MOM intervened to secure compensation for her because employment law had been violated. MOM also stressed that workplaces must be, must be preserved as a circular space in Singapore. Thus, I hope the minister can clarify how recommendation number 10 is aligned with MOM's stance in 2013, or whether MOM's stance has changed since then. If recommendation number 10 is adopted, then I would like to call on the government to include sexual orientation as a protected category in the anti-discrimination law. This is in line with the spirit of repealing section 377A based on 377A and will better protect LGBT workers from discrimination based on their sexuality, which still exists in Singapore. LGBT workers should be allowed to earn a living on the level playing field based on merit like anyone else in Singapore. 
Finally, I would like the government to elaborate on actions it has taken since October 2022 to ensure that employers without genuine occupational requirements no longer practice VDS or vaccination differentiated measures. Is the employment rate of unvaccinated citizens back on par with vaccinated citizens for each age group? Mr. Chairman, workplace fairness is an important issue, and PSP is glad that the government will be enshrining this in law next year. But when drafting the law, I hope the government will enforce a level playing field for Singaporeans and ensure that workplaces remain circular. Singaporeans deserve better for country, for people. Thank you. Now let, now, let me share about the workplace fairness legislation, which is a significant step towards ensuring a level playing field. Mr. Gerald Giam asked for comprehensive protection for persons with disability, while Mr. Leong Man Wai suggested to cover sexual orientation in the legislation. They both can be assured that all forms of discrimination are not tolerated. This is our national policy and it is reflected in the tripartite guidelines for fair employment practices today. The tripartite committee has recommended that the new legislation provide stronger protection against discrimination on the grounds of nationality, age, sex, race, religion, disability and mental health conditions. Stronger protection against discrimination in the proposed areas also supports Singapore's key social and economic objectives. For instance, protecting against discrimination on the grounds of age helps to support the employment of mature workers, which is critical for our ageing society. These characteristics are the common and familiar forms of workplace discrimination in Singapore. Together, they account for more than 95% of discrimination complaints received by TAFEP and MOM in the past five years. We have experience dealing with these cases and we are confident to mediate them, to mediate them effectively. Tripartite partners will work with relevant stakeholders to ensure that there's clarity on issues such as definitions and scope of employers' responsibilities to enable the legislation to achieve its intended effect. Some MPs have raised suggestions on the legislation. Mr Leong asked how the legislation will address job security for Singaporeans. Legislation will benefit Singaporeans by better protecting them against workplace discrimination. There will be a wider range of enforcement levers against errant employers that are more effective as deterrents against workplace discrimination. The Fair Consideration Framework job advertising requirement will also be legislated, which will allow us to take action against employers who breach this requirement using the new enforcement levers. The Tripartite Committee has also recommended protection against retaliation for those who report workplace discrimination or harassment to give assurance to employees to come forward to report it. The majority of complaints on nationality discriminations are by locals indeed. So they will benefit from the greater protection. Mr Leong also suggested small firms should not be exempted from the legislation. Small firms may not have the corporate competencies to comprehensively implement the new rules from day one. As the proposed legislation is only the first step, we will exempt small firms with fewer than 25 employees for a start. Workers in small firms, however, will continue to still be covered by TGFEP. Those who are unfairly dismissed can lodge claims with TADEM, the Tripartite Alliance for Dispute Management. For these employers, we will also step up education and enforcement efforts via the TGFEP. The Tripartite Committee agrees that we will monitor the ground situation after legislation is introduced and review the exemption with a view to tightening it within five years. Now, Mr Leong referred to a specific case in the religious organisation in 2013. For that case, based on 
prevailing guidelines and laws, the church did not have sufficient grounds to dismiss the employee. With the introduction of the workplace fairness legislation, the tripartite committee consulted various agencies, religious organisations and advocacy groups on their views. We recognise that maintaining religious harmony is important in our multi-religious society. It is therefore important to give religious organisations the space to practise their religion. As such, given the purpose and the character of religious organisations, the Tripartite Committee has recommended allowing religious organisations the discretion to make employment decisions based on religion and their religious requirements. It must be emphasised that this discretion given to religious organisations is very carefully scoped. It will only apply to places of worship and religious organisations with sole religious purpose and function. It will also not allow them to discriminate based on other protected characteristics where there's no religious basis to do so. On the question of vaccination differentiated measures, we have reached out to and offered employment assistance to the unvaccinated workers. They can also approach WSG or E2I if they require further assistance. Workers who feel that their employers are imposing vaccination as a requirement without genuine occupational needs may approach MOM or TAFEP for assistance. Since the release of the updated advisory on COVID-19 vaccination at the workplace in October 2022, there's only been a handful of such complaints. Thank you, Chairman. And uh, I have uh, three questions uh, for the Minister. But before that, I'd like to thank the Minister for uh, answering all my questions except one with very direct and succinct answers. I usually don't get that from uh, most of the other Ministers. Um, uh, but however, we have to continue to work on uh, improving the uh, situation for Singapore, Singaporean workers because while the uh, job situation has kind of improved, uh, because of the opening, job and wage growth is still very uneven. Uh, for example, even uh, MOM admitted that out of the 47,400 job growth in the fourth quarter of 2022, uh, most, of that, most of that was actually from the non-residents. And there are some complaints from IT graduates that uh, they, they are unable to find jobs as soon as they want. Okay, so I have three questions. First, the question that the minister didn't uh, answer me can the minister, uh, can I ask the minister, what makes him and the policymakers so certain that the Singaporean PMEs are not disadvantaged, although employers do not need to contribute CPF for the EPs? First question. Second question, can I ask whether the minister will consider accelerating the income increase under the PWM so that lower income workers can get a minimum of $1,800 of monthly take home pay by 2024. Looking at the materials that was distributed by uh, the minister, uh, the, the, the lower income workers will get that by 2028. But that is far too long, you know, five years uh, uh, to wait. Bearing in mind that many of these workers also su suffer considerably during the pand pandemic. Last question, does the minister expect Singaporeans to occupy a larger share of our IT jobs going forward, especially in the higher positions in the next five years, given that the number of IT graduates, local IT graduates, have increased, will be increasing significantly over the next few years? Thank you. Now, to uh, Mr. Leong's four points. I hope that uh, Mr. Leong, um, thank you for that compliment. Um, it is really uh, the, the collective work of all of my colleagues uh, in uh, the Manpower Ministry. And I've also learned a lot from my learned colleagues here um, in, in their responses and replies to your questions as well. Uh, so if you look at it, we are at almost full 
employment. I mean, we are at 3% above pre-pandemic. This is 3% above 2019. I mean, at a point in time when, when our resident employment uh, is, is, is at this kind of high level, for companies to, to want to grow, to fulfill orders and so on, they have to hire. They have to hire workers. So, obviously, in the fourth quarter, you see more non-residents finding jobs. Now, to your point about how certain am I that Singaporean PMEs are not disadvantaged because the e-pass holders, the employment pass holders, don't have, the employers don't have to contribute the CPF. Please refer to my numerous explanations in the past that the way we calculate the minimum qualifying salary is after taking into consideration the gross salary of a local on a similar cohort eh, plus the CPF contribution of the employer and we set that as the benchmark. So, just if you look at it from the perspective of someone who has been here for 10 years, the salary of that e-pass holder is on a rising scale. It will not be at 5,000. The EP holder, for him to be able to get the e-pass, he would have, uh, the company would have to set that qualifying salary probably at above $10,000. So with that, we believe that we have adequately addressed any form of income disparity between our local versus foreign. On top of that, we don't see a need for us to ensure that foreigners have to contribute to CPF because our CPF provides for retirement adequacy, housing, a roof over the heads of our Singaporeans. We don't see the need to provide the same level of safety net for foreigners. Hence, we don't impose the CPF contribution on them. To your point about um, the larger share of IT jobs, the, the, how to accelerate the income for PWM, I will leave it to SMS Zaki to answer your question. But to your last point about how do I ensure that the larger share of IT jobs in high positions will go to Singaporeans in the next five years. We will continue through all of the programs that I've been painstakingly elaborating on over the last two days. Whether it's the SGEP, the Global Ready Talent, the Tech at SG, these are all programs that we set up to train, to invest, to upskill and to reskill our Singaporean core talent. And we will continue to do so. And you, if you have Mr. Leong, even more constructive programs that we can do to train, to upskill our Singaporean core, I'm happy to, to also take that into consideration. But the nature of whether I can provide some form of guarantee over the next five years, whether they will all end up in high positions, I don't think anyone can guarantee that. We can guarantee a level playing field at, as of the outset at every single level. But I don't think anyone can guarantee a similar high outcome or success for everyone. I hope that answers your question. Uh, maybe SMS Zaki, thank you. Thanks, Minister. I just want to bring members back to this infographic that we shared, which Mr. Leong shared, which I thought was really quite clear. Um, that actually most of your PWMs that you see here are, you know, are, are pretty much above 1,008 for most of them. I mean, and you look at the wage growth, for example, I take security that 2,585, 2023 today. And by the time you hit 2028, it's 3,005. The, the kind of wage growth is quite significant, 56%. Landscape workers, 1,007, admittedly, maybe below 1,008. Cleaning, it's 1,570, but by 2028, you get 2004. That's an 84% wage increase in five years. So there is a scheduled step, but at the same time, you can almost be guaranteed that almost all of them, in fact, all of them will exceed 1008 as a start. But let's also not forget 
that the government's approach goes beyond just wages too. We forgot to include workfare, which, you know, if you think about $4,200 a year, that's about $350 per month in addition for, depends on your age and criteria, but, you know, generally you could get as much as that. That covers about 25% of your wage in addition topped up by government. So if you look at total income, I think let's look at entirety. But I have to credit, you know, the... Um, the union as well as the employers as well for standing with us on this because the last two years have not been easy. We've just come out of the pandemic, but yet to see both the labour movement and the employers agree to such aggressive uh, pay increases, I think that speaks volumes of our tripartite movement in terms of supporting our low-wage workers and standing in solidarity with them. I think that's quite critical for us to remember that we are still coming out of the pandemic and yet, you know, we are agreeing to wage increases of 56%, 84%, and significant numbers. So, but we have to also be realistic that, you know, to push any further, I think, I don't think the employers can take it. <laughs> so, we have to keep watch, but that's why the government also supports them through the PWCS. So, I just thought to set the context, but rest assured, we are all on the same page. We are here to support our low-wage workers. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Just a further clarification from my uh, question just now. One... First of all, the uh, PWM um, uh, thanks the MOS for uh, the, the reply, but I think uh, he has uh, not uh, uh, compared like to like. Eh? What uh, PSP has recommended in terms of the living wage is $1,800 take-home pay, but the figure shown on the material is actually gross salaries. Eh? So um, I just want to clarify that. And also I want to ask one more clarification uh, uh, with the MOS is that if government is already contributing more in terms of WIS. Why don't just add the WIS into the salary and then make it a clear one policy living wage? Okay, so that's one question. The other question uh, I want to uh, clarify with the uh, minister. Of course, minister, I, I have got uh, that answer from you before, but uh, I think we have not exhausted the discussion, so let me carry on with that. Um, the... Um, in terms of I'm the afraid, uh, Mr. Leong, it's not time for discussions. It's us. It's time uh, for clarifications. Yes, clarifications. And this is your second bite of the cherry. So I'd ask you to keep it concise and short, please. Yeah, thank you very In much. In fairness Chairman. to the whole yes, house. Yes, okay. Yeah, so um, can I ask that the salary component that you talk about, that you have adjusted the salary of the EP so that it is comparable with... Uh, Singaporeans having to pay CPF, but the EP doesn't have to say, pay C, uh, CPF. Do you think that is a strong enough deterrent, really? Don't you think that, or, or do you think that the, uh, uh, the, 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 the recommendation made by us imposing a levy will be a better solution? Thanks. You know, I'm not sure how much more I have to go through the sheet. <laughs> but, you know, we, we already have a schedule and every single one of these items here will be past 1,008 for sure. And, you know, I, I don't know how you want to define your living wage, but anyone can put a number. But what, like what I've said, what's different between our approach and what you say, anyone can put a number. Is it 1,008, 1,006, 2,005? Name it. Lah. But the difference is that, you know, in our approach, you know, the employers and the labour movement come to consensus. Basically means when we put a number down here, it is something that employers say they can bear. The market can absorb this. And the wage growths here are already as aggressive as I think anyone can do during COVID. I mean, we have to be very fair to employers in the market. So, you know, if I said, look again at the wage growth, 84% for cleaners, 56% for, for security officers, you know, um, 45, 66%. I mean, you can, you can, it, is, it is quite aggressive as it is. So to a large extent, I just want to say this again. Bear in mind the market conditions which we operate in. At the same time, our approach is, you know, one that I think is fair, balanced, uh, one that the market is prepared to pay. The, the employers have all agreed to this. And it, the, the schedule is transparent. And therefore, you know, to, to a large extent, I think bearable by the market, supported by government. And whether you put work fair into this or not, I mean, honestly, what the worker really, what really matters to the workers, what they get in their pockets every month. And that's where, you know, we have to put in place, you know, various measures. And this is not the only measure. Because the government also provides other schemes, including Comcare, civil support, and the whole of slew of government grants that goes into our workforce to support our low-wage workers, including healthcare subsidies and housing subsidies. 
education subsidies. So the government puts a lot of commitment and, 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 and that's where I think we show how we care overall, you know, and not just in terms of living wage, but every other support and subsidy you can think of the government can provide. So, sir, you know, I just want to say, you know, you, anyone can put a number, but I think what's key is whether you can deliver and you can execute. So that's where our focus will be in the next coming years. Thank you. Minister Tan Si Leng. I'm sorry, Ms. Yeo. Um, I think we, we just need to get this thing off. Mr. Leong, um, I think in the interest of, of uh, time and so on, I'll try and keep it short. But actually, um, all I can do is just refer you back to the Hansard for you to read the thing, and the position hasn't changed. But I think it's late. You've asked quite a number of questions. I, I just want to sort of uh, address some of it. Now, your approach that you talk about in terms of imposing hard caps on the number of foreigners from each nationality that a firm can hire, I think the approach is, is very, very rigid. And it's overly so. I, I've been in private sector all my life. And I've also set up businesses in many countries. I think if you do that, many of my own networks would probably give this place a miss. The reality is that if you structure an industry, you want to grow the industry, it's a combination of making sure that we invest in our people. At the same time, we are also able to imbibe, imbibe, the word is imbibe, not, not open the doors and let them in freely, but imbibe enough talent so that they can actually complement our local talent and we all then prosper together. I think that is a more nuanced approach. We have introduced Compass, and Compass takes a very nuanced position by incentivizing firms to strengthen their local core and the workforce diversity. And we also still ensure that in the event that these companies need the additional talent, which you see is the common and recurring theme around our debate for the last many days. There are many, many MPs on both sides of the House who keep telling us and lamenting on how tight the talent situation, the manpower situation here is in this country. So we want to ensure that they still have access, these companies still have access to high quality complementary candidates so that there are certain niche skills and skills that continue to, 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 to be evolved, all right, that we can bring them in and also train our local talent as well so that they can actually create more good job opportunities for our locals. Now, you talk about, you keep harping on this thing about imposing a levy. It is easy enough for the government to do so because it generates revenue, right? But at the EP level, Mr. Leong, our focus is really on making sure that we can differentiate and we can get the best, the highest quality, the highest qualified talent anywhere in the world to come here. And if you look at it, employers do not have infinite budgets for manpower. We should think about a win-win partnership where we benefit, we, we let the employer win so that our or his Singaporean employees will also have that win. And that has been our intention. And that's why all of the policies that we focus, we focus on making sure that our economy is vibrant so that there's enough resources for us to continue to invest back in our people, to continue to develop Singapore, progress Singapore to a place that's brimming with opportunities, with hope, and with always optimism. I hope that you can put that aside and focus on bringing all of us together and building that Singapore for our future. Thank you. Because I think that is the core of what we do. Thank you.